Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ohio Huntsman Podcast with your hosts Jason, Jacob, and Jeff. And on this week's show, we talk about the proposed regulation changes that the ODNR has published and sort of give our thoughts on them, what we think about them, and how you guys can submit your comments to the ODNR on whether or not you you like these proposed changes, want to see some modifications made to them, or whatnot. So in the show notes, there will be a link where you can submit public comments for these proposed changes on the ODNR's online submittal form. You also have the ability to go to the open house events. So the open house events are all across the state on March 2nd. You can go to one of these events and submit your comments that way, talk to somebody from the ODNR about these proposed changes, and hopefully get questions answered while you're there. We focus a lot on the changes, the proposed changes, to allow the multi-year or lifetime licenses to be good even if you're no longer a resident. We talk about the proposal for allowing for an electronic tag instead of a paper tag, as well as some of the terminology changes for the antlerless tags and season dates. So stick around for that. But before we get into that, I want to talk about our partner for this show, which is Monster Whitetail Grub. Monster Whitetail Grub is an Ohio-based deer feed company, and it's not just a bag of flavored corn. It's a high-protein feed that's got all different kinds of grains in it. It's also got mineral mixed into it, so the deer continue to come back after the physical feed is gone, and so it keeps them on a schedule, and the great thing is it gives them good nutrition this time of year when they're really looking for those calories to get them through the rest of the winter. So... I urge you to check out Monster Whitetail Grub. There'll be links to their Facebook and Instagram pages in the show notes. Support them. They support us. And everybody's happy. It's a great, great company, and we're happy to be partners with them. And with that, let's get into the show. They post the the regulation or the proposed regulation changes every year, give the public time to review the the proposals, And then they provide a public comment period where you can say, yes, I like these changes. No, I don't like these changes. And so what we're going to do today is just talk through the changes and sort of our thoughts on them, why we think they might be doing these, and go from there. So they also propose the season dates in this and not... Not unsurprisingly, I guess, the season dates for deer season, they're proposing to be the same. They have given the proposed turkey season dates, which I've got here. So the year, the youth, excuse me, youth turkey season dates are, they're proposing April 18th and 19th, and those will be all day. So a half hour before sunrise to sunset. The northeast zones would be May 4th through May 10th. Those dates are half hour before sunrise to noon, and then starting May 11th through May 31st would be your all-day hunts, half hour before sunrise to sunset. The southern zone is April 20th through the 26th. Those are your half-day hunts, half hour before sunrise to noon. And then April 27th through May 17th are your all-day turkey hunts. So that's coming up i don't those don't to my knowledge those don't typically get disputed or or changed they propose the dates and that's typically when the dates are is that what you guys have seen yeah with most of these proposals um unless there's a large outcry you know people really don't like them typically these proposals go through there is there has been instances where they don't um the most recent one i have in memory was the uh the limited bobcat trapping season last year. Um, there was a large public outcry against that, and that one didn't end up going through. Okay. So, if, you, if you've never read through the proposed regulation changes, I encourage everybody to check it out. I'll post a link to where you can find the regulation changes. We've already posted on our social pages about some of this, so if you've been following us there, you may have seen some of this. But... We kind of wanted to dive into it, uh, you know, a little deeper and talk about some of the ones that we thought were interesting. From what I'm seeing, you know, there's 
nothing major. A lot of it is is sort of clarification, clearing up wording, you know, what the new season dates are going to be. For example, one of the changes they're proposing is to change the wording of antlerless permits to management permits. And it, and it says in there that they're doing that to help clarify to hunters that it is a, excuse me, that it is a permit designed to fulfill management needs. So just a, a sort of verbiage thing, but I can see how that, right, they're using the antlerless permits to manage the population, right? So Yeah, and there was... Uh, a lot of people were getting confused with that, especially out-of-state hunters were getting confused with that because they thought that antlerless permits were doe tags that were, you know, able to be used anywhere where that wasn't oh. the case. So I think it was a lot of, to clean up a lot of that confusion that it's not just a doe tag, it's a special tag to be used in special zones. Okay. So some of the other changes i guess let's get into some of the changes that are actually gonna affect hunters come 2019 assuming they become you know they go into is it law i guess i don't go into law yeah, go yeah, into would, effect. yeah i think yeah. so so there's the the three big ones i had were the deer surveillance area requirement that they're changing the multi-year slash lifetime license change and the electronic tag thing. So those are kind of high-level notes I made for myself. But we'll start with the, probably because it won't spur as much conversation, Well, I want to start with the, the deer surveillance area. So if you aren't aware, they it was this year, right, Jeff, that they started the, the deer surveillance areas in homes well, in, what was it, Tuscarora's County? Yeah, there, there was a different deer surveillance area um, in the same general area that had just expired in the summer because they had not detected any deer with uh, CWD in any of the farms um, in that area for so long, and there was none in the wild population. So the surveillance area had just expired, and then they found another deer, a uh, farm deer with CWD. So then they started a new deer surveillance area in the same general area of the state. Yeah, I guess I should back up. We just jumped right into deer surveillance areas. For those of you that don't know, the ODNR uses deer surveillance areas to monitor CWD. So they've detected, like Jeff mentioned, they've detected CWD or they found a, a CWD positive deer in a deer farm. And so they set up a deer surveillance area or a disease, sorry, a disease surveillance area or DSA around that area in order to monitor the wild deer population to know or hopefully detect if that CWD has gotten into the wild deer population. That's what we're talking about when we say DSA or disease surveillance area. So they are, they, they're proposing to change the rule to only require heads from deer in the deer surveillance area, wild deer harvested in the deer sur disease surveillance area during gun season. Is that what you guys were seeing? Norm, last year it was all yeah. season, is that right? <laughs> last oh, it was year all, it was, yeah, it was gun season, extended gun, and muzzleloader. Right, it was all firearms. Season. Right. Oh, okay, okay. Now they're just going down to the week-long standard firearm season. Okay. Right, and I believe also all roadkill deer need to be reported, and that that's not changing. And that's not a, that's not a, uh, what I'll call a pedestrian or, or a civilian saying, hey, there's a, there's a deer been hit on my road. That's like the road crews are going out to collect these deer. They run them by the, yes, wherever the surveillance is, where they're taking these lymph nodes to check for CWD. Yes, I believe so. Okay. So anything else you guys wanted to talk about on that one? Any other thoughts? Uh, I mean, I just for completeness sake, I guess, Jeff and I talked about this off air. Initially, I was um, kind of disappointed or concerned that they were stepping back their CWD surveillance. Um, if you listen to previous podcasts, we talk about CWD a little bit more in depth. And it is something we certainly do not want in Ohio. 
Um, but after talking with Jeff a little bit off the air when it when these first came out, I think it's primarily just because the number of deer harvested in the muzzleloader and or extended gun seasons just isn't enough to warrant staffing a CWD check station, so to speak. Right. Um, so, I mean, initially I'm concerned because I think more surveillance, the better when it comes to CWD because we do not want it in our wild deer herd. Definitely. But I also do under, I mean, I get it. If there's just not that many deer to make it feasible financially, then I can understand why they're stepping it back. Um, you know, I'm a, obviously they didn't find anything this season or else it would have came out in the news. Um, so they had it monitoring all those seasons this year and there was no reports that came back positive, at least not that we've heard about. I would imagine they would have made that public information. Yeah, I would. I'm sure you would have heard about it. We would have heard about it. Somebody would have, you know, you'd have seen something on Facebook or something. So, all right. You guys want to move on to the next one then? Yep. Yeah. All right. All right. So the next one I had, which is referring to the multi-year uh, licenses for the lifetime licenses. So I'm, I'm sure everybody's aware at this point that Ohio has now started issuing multi-year hunting licenses as well as lifetime licenses. So, and I should have, I should have researched what the multi-year year increments are, but I know one, like you can get a 10 year license. It's one of three year license or something like that. You guys know what they are off the top of your head? Yeah, I'm not off the top of my head, but it, I think it was three, five and ten, maybe. I'm not That's, sure. Yeah, something. Anyhow, I guess it doesn't possibly. necessarily matter. But other than the fact that you can now buy multi-year licenses as well as a lifetime license. So you would buy a lifetime license once and never have to pay for a hunting license again. So they are adding some wording in there this year that will allow or not allow, but I guess we'll state that the multi-year license and or the lifetime license will continue to be valid in this state regardless of residency. So if you buy, I guess the easiest example is if you buy a lifetime license and 10 years down the road, your job moves or, you know, you move to another state, your Ohio hunting license, your lifetime license will still be valid in Ohio for the rest of your life. Right. Is that how you guys understand that? Yeah. 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 I looked it up real quick here. It is three, five and 10 year and then okay. lifetime. So just for completeness sake, it's a three year, five year, 10 year or a lifetime license. Okay. And then as far as I'm on uh, understanding, I guess also just to prevent any uproar or complaint, I'm, they're not offering a lifetime non-resident license. Correct. You still have to be a resident currently to purchase a lifetime license and then if you leave the state it's still valid right so if you buy a 10-year license today and next year your like i said your job or something moves you to another state for the next 10 years you can use that license in ohio as if you were a resident right yeah any thoughts on that like it hate it i'll start uh I think I hate it. Um, I don't think I like it. Um, yeah. Just for the fact that I I can see there being this causing a lot more criminals, a lot more fraud in this scenario. Awesome. Um, where people are going to just claim that they live here for one year, you know, get use their buddy's address for one year. You know, especially people who live by the border, you know, use their buddy's address for one year, get a lifetime license, and then they're good forever. Sure. Um, Also, with people who are, you know, they know they're only going to be here for a short period of time, being able to buy a lifetime hunting license, you know, someone could go to first you know sake of argument someone could come here for college you know and they they plan to live in a neighboring state their whole life but they come here for college which would establish them you know if they're living on campus that establish a residence here 
they can buy a lifetime license and then go somewhere else, you know, move back, but then they still have the benefits of having a lifetime license. So sure. it's basically a, a non-resident, someone whose tax dollars aren't going to pay for this herd is getting the benefits of being a resident. Um, so I don't really, I don't think I like it. Um, I would be perfectly fine with it if it was, you know, it doesn't expire if you move away. If you move back, it's good again. You know, say your job moves you away for five years, you come back and your lifetime license is still valid. I'd be perfectly fine with that. Right. But this just allows you to only have lived in the state for a very short period of time, but get the benefit of a lifetime resident. You know, so I I don't think I'm a big fan of it. I would be curious to see the data on because I've got to imagine that they're banking on people buying this license and either not banking on, I don't want to say that, that doesn't sound right, but there's going to be some scenarios where you buy a lifetime license, and I just keep using that one because it's, I guess, the easiest, right? Because it's for your whole Mm -hmm. life. And you move away, whether you, you know, something happens and you move away. You decide to move away, your job moves away, something. You move away because your kids move to, you know, I don't know, whatever, it doesn't matter. But you move away. I've got to imagine they ran the numbers on that and those type of scenarios to where, like, those guys, they have the ability to come back here, but it's not just a tag and license, right? There's, like, if you're living in, whatever, Kansas, right, it's not going to be cheap to come back to Ohio to deer hunt for a weekend or something. So I would venture to guess that those guys are going to buy a license. There's going to be some scenarios, right, where a guy buys a license, a lifetime license, and doesn't use it. And so I guess I'm kind of rambling here, but I, I, I think I am in support of it in that, yeah, there's going to be some guys that, that might try to game the system, but I, I think it will be better financially especially initially, because people might have been apprehensive, like, boy, lifetime, you know, it's nice, but I don't know if I'm going to be here for a lifetime, so do I really want to spend the, and I don't know the numbers, just shy of $500 or something, right, on a Mm -hmm. lifetime license? It might end up being better financially because people are going to, well, if it's good for my whole life, even if I move away, I'll buy it. But the odds of them, once they're coming away... Right. I mean, they can, right? They've got a license as a resident right. license. But, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I'd like to see I'd, the data, I guess. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to hope that they, you know, ran some numbers on this. You know, I would assume that they did and that they found that the numbers say that it's in in the state's benefit. Um, at least I'd like to hope so. I would assume that they would not offer a lifetime license unless the numbers show that they end up making more revenue than charging someone an annual license fee. Right. I mean, they had to have. I mean, they wouldn't even offer it if they're not, I mean, it's, if they're not making profit or making more revenue on it, there's no reason for them to offer it. You know, I mean, guys that are hunting Ohio are going to buy a license every year because they have no choice. Right. So they've got to have crunched the numbers and figured out that based on the average age, the average remaining quote unquote hunt years, the price of a tag, you know, the price of a license, et cetera, et cetera, it comes out as at least a zero. They're certainly not losing money, I would venture right. yeah. to guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's there's studies on that you know, that you can look up on the internet for residents who, you know, live there. And I'm perfectly for a resident lifetime hunting license. Right. The only thing I'm apprehensive about is the making it good for life, no matter your resident status. Well, 
what and I don't know the answer to this, so maybe hopefully one of you guys do. Otherwise, we'll have to figure it out. Um, what does it take to establish residence in Ohio? Do you have to be here a year, six months? What is it? I don't even know. I have no like clue. One of you. <laughs> I I would assume it's similar to like a you know like the DMV type rules, which mean you know is that you have to spend the majority of your year any Time. year here yeah in the state you know like people who you know split time between here and florida you know the winter birds or whatever snowbirds Um, yep yeah snowbirds that's the word i was looking for you know that's kind of they have to determine which location they spend the majority of their time in and that's the determining factor right yeah i would that would make sense so I get, you know, it kind of comes down to, and this is with everything, right? And we and we hear about this on social a lot. It's like, are you making laws? I don't know how I want to say this. You know, you can make laws, but criminals are going to be criminals. Right. And I'm not saying that people trying to gain the system on a lifetime license are a criminal, but you know, are you in this case, right? You're 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 making a law makes it better for people that are just by circumstance, right? Might in a roundabout way, feel like they kind of got screwed, right? I I paid for this lifetime license and then something happened and I moved away and you guys just kept all my money. Well, now they're, you know, they can still use that and come back to Ohio and hunt and bring money to the economy, right? They're going to, that money is not going to go directly to conservation and, and Ohio's, deer but it's going to go into ohio's economy right they're going to come they're right. going to need a hotel they're going to eat they're going to buy groceries you know, right. buy gas yeah uh, so are you and maybe a fair compromise is maybe they should say to initially get a lifetime hunting license a resident lifetime hunting license you have to have lived in the state for x number of years that yeah. way you can't yeah, just yeah. move here as a transient if you will You know, your job brings you here for a year and you get a lifetime license. You know, maybe, it. you know, they should change the wording that, you know, you have to be a resident for five years or. Yeah, I could get behind that. Yeah, Yeah, I could get behind that. I'd be curious to know kind of along what I was talking about earlier, what the ODNR is going to do to prove residency. You know what I mean? Like, because right now you just get on and put your address in and. I don't know what they do to check that or not check that, but a guy has a system, right? A guy has a camp, you know, out of state resident has a camp in Ohio. He's got an address in Ohio. He's got a cabin. It's got an address. You know, if he puts that down, I mean, how are they going to, I would almost guarantee that. that they're running against driver's license records. Okay. You know, and if you don't have a driver's license in this state, then they're going to be checking into it. I would yeah. almost guarantee it. I definitely could get behind the five years or, you know, pick the number. I don't know. Something to stop it, like you said, from the transient. What makes me think of five years is most people that would come here for college would be here four years. I don't know. That's, I guess, where five years jumped into my head. But, um, mm-hmm. You know, you got to have residency for five years before qualifying. You know, I don't know. Another thing, and this is totally off the wall, but another idea that might make it a little more quote unquote fair or easier to swallow when someone leaves and keeps their lifetime resident license. And um, this is not going to happen, but it's just another idea that I just came up with is if you started to charge like a out of state tag versus a resident tag, put a little bit extra on their tag. So then you have, have, they have started to do that. So yeah, I guess that would probably, because you wouldn't apply, you wouldn't be eligible for a resident tag anymore. Right. You'd be an out of state deer tag. And they just raised the price of out of state deer tags. See, which makes it a lot better for me now that you mentioned that. Right. Yeah. And is it a bad thing? You know, Jake, you mentioned the 
the college student, like, is it a bad thing if you scoop up that $500 from a, and I know $500 isn't the exact price, but I'm just using that for a round number. Is it bad if the ODNR scoops up that $500 while they're here for college and they think, you know, they're a, they're a forward thinking young college graduate or college attendee and thinking, boy, I'm going to get this lifetime license while I'm here and now I can come back. But I would I would venture to guess that the vast majority right. of those people yeah. are they're not going to come back every year and hunt. Right. Yeah, then they then they take a job in California and yeah. And I would do that. one better, you know, because if Colorado had this rule, as a high school student, I may have considered going to college in Colorado just to get that lifetime hunting license in Colorado to save right. the money. Right. You know, so you could increase, you know college attendance you know i mean out of state college attendance which i mean brings a lot of money you know into the ohio economy so that's right. that's a big benefit where it gets weird and i heard about this on randy newberg's podcast out west right you have tag draws right it's all lottery points all that stuff they he talked about going to school in Arizona for a period of time. And at that time, now this was a lot of years ago, I have no idea what the rules or laws or anything are, but at that time they were able to buy a lifetime license. And now like the one guy did, but, but Randy Randy Newberg didn't. Right. And so that guy, his buddy can put into the resident tag draw every year because he bought the lifetime resident license when he was there as a college student that opens up a whole nother can of worms that I, I don't, I don't want to go down that, that wormhole t- today, but it's just something else to right. think about. Right. If you're, if you, if you right, go to that, a lottery system, how does that affect it? You know? Right. Yeah. Or, I mean, especially, and this is really going down the road. I mean, you go to a lottery system or, you know, 50 years down the road, elk get reestablished in Ohio, and now there's a, certainly going to be a lottery system for that. Yep. And now you have a resident, quote-unquote resident, who doesn't actually live in the state, but qualifies for your resident tag. Yeah. You know, I again, that's a long, far-off stretch, but something maybe that isn't out of the realm of possibility. Are you, speaking of elk, are you guys on that... Uh that Facebook group about reassembling elk in Ohio? Yeah, I'm on it. Yeah, yeah, I I follow them on Facebook. I see their stuff pop up from time to time. I just ask because it's, you know, it's pretty cool. It'd be cool to have elk back in Ohio. Yeah. Groups seems to be growing pretty quickly, so. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely a exciting idea. I think we're research wise a little ways off of that coming to you know reality but it is it is an exciting idea for sure yeah all right well uh do you guys have one you want to touch on or well on on the same vein there was another change to the lifetime license now with it's proposed that you will no longer need to have past hunter safety to get a lifetime hunting license oh yeah that was interesting which i believe the main purpose of that is so that you can buy in in a lot of states that have lifetime hunting license it's tradition to buy your child a lifetime hunting license on their first birthday like that's their first birthday gift so i'm assuming that that's what it's for is for basically buying your kid a lifetime hunting license And then when they get of age, you know, they use it because the way that it's written is until you pass hunter ed, the lifetime hunting license is effectively an apprentice hunting license. Yeah, that's what I said. Then once you pass hunter's ed, then it becomes a standard hunting license. Right. So So that's exciting. Yeah. That's exciting, you know, because I think that'll, that's where a lot of money will be probably brought in with people who buy a lifetime hunting license and never really use it right 
is people buying their kids lifetime hunting licenses kid grows up and doesn't enjoy the outdoors yeah that's i've I've got to imagine that's the thought behind that right is that these grandpa's going to buy his grandson a, a hunting license lifetime hunting license and there's i mean it's just going to happen, right? There's some of those kids are going to grow up and not be interested in hunting. And, but the ODNR has gotten that, that revenue, which is good for Ohio's deer. And so, yeah, I, I think I like that one. Anything else on that before we move on? No, I'm good on that. Okay. So the other one, the other big one is, the no longer needing to have and i i don't have the exact wording here but basically you're going to be able to have an electronic tag instead of having a paper tag on you somebody have the exact wording up by chance i don't have the exact wording um but by the way i was reading this is well first off you can have an electronic hunting license which they had already switched to for fishing licenses, but not hunting licenses. Okay. So your hunting license can be electronic now, which is great. You know, I really like that. Now, what? by the way I'm reading it with the deer tag is basically it would be legal as, as the way it's proposed right now. It would be legal to carry an electronic deer tag, but where... It, it, it would, it's not going to be legal yet to not fill out the deer tag, like at the point of harvest. Okay. And I believe on paper, like they, it's to prepare for when they have a system that will allow you to do that, fill it out electronically, but they don't have that system yet. All right, so I pulled up the wording here, and it says, It is proposed that this rule be amended to allow hunters to carry a printed or electronic version of their deer permit and report the harvest of a deer via an electronic reporting system. Proper tagging of each deer killed may remain a requirement, or not may, will remain a requirement. However, a hunter would no longer need to immediately attach a temporary tag to a deer at the place where it fell. The hunter can complete the required information on their permit, and as long as they are with the deer, it can remain untagged until they arrive at a residence or at a temporary lodging. Right. So there's two things that they're telling us there. You know, the the, the first one is the electronic tag. The second one is that your temp tag that you have to physically attach to the animal will no longer be a requirement. Right. And well, the temp tag one, I really like because I always have that worry that as I'm dragging a deer out of the woods, the temp tag is going to fall off. And yeah. then I get to the road and I don't have, you know, I have an illegal deer basically. Right. You know, until I find a, a, the temp tag. So I guess just by listening to what you read there, I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but. You don't have to print your tag and have it on your person, but you're still going to need it printed because you'll have to fill it out when you get home. That's my, that's, yeah, that's where it's a little weird. It's like, well, I'm just still going to carry a printed tag then. Right, because you still have to fill it out. And the temp, or the game tag thing, is it that you don't have to fill it out at all, or you don't have to attach it to the deer? My understanding is you still need to fill out that information whether it's on your permanent tag or what, but it needs to be written. It just doesn't have to be on the animal because I think it still has to be. Yeah, the ODNR is going to have to give some clarification on this, but the way I understand it is that your actual permanent tag, the paper tag that you print out, Mm -hmm. that needs to be filled out at the location of harvest. It needs filled out just like it always has needed to be. Right. The temporary tag that you are attaching to the animal will no longer be a thing. Okay. So, but they're saying you don't need to have your tag on your person, though. So you have to fill out something 
at the location of harvest. So it sounds to me like you still need a game tag. You just need to keep it in your pocket. <laughs> right. Deer, when you say a game tag, you're talking a deer tag? I'm talking a temporary game tag that you used to have to stick on the carcass. Okay. Or the, you know, the animal. Yeah. You have to put it in the ear, or attach it to the antler or whatever. You're still going to need at least that to write your county of harvest, time of kill, hunter name, etc. Um, because if you don't have a printed deer tag, because you don't need one, you're allowed to have an electronic one. Yes. Technically. Technically, yeah. yes. So if you don't have that on your person, you can't fill that out. So if that's back at the cabin, you still need some sort of a makeshift game tag. You just don't have to attach it to the animal anymore. Yeah, but at this point, the way that I'm understanding this is you don't need to have the tag to hunt. But as soon as you harvest that animal, you you do need to fill out your permanent tag. So if you can't fill it out digitally on your phone, you have to fill it out on paper. Right, right then and there at the location of harvest. Right. Okay. So, and so basically, I, you still need to have it on you. Yes. At this point, I believe this is preparing them to basically launching like an app that you can fill out your game tag on your phone. So right, that because because well, I've got a well and good, but they're putting the cart in front of the horse then, because if they don't have that ability, they shouldn't make a law that states you don't need to have it on your person. It doesn't make sense. Right. I, that's just that's just tricking people into getting tickets. It seems confusing to me. They're they're going to need to clarify. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that proposal definitely leaves some, some questions to be answered. So... Sounds like a good, good sounds like a good topic for Mike. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's a good segue to talk about the the open house events, right? So they I'm I'm on the ODNR's website on their open houses or on their open house event sections here. And they are saying these are these events public participation is encouraged. Right? So they want you to come to these events and give your input on the proposed rule changes. So they the open houses are from 12 to 3 on March 2nd. Sad, that's a Saturday, March 2nd. And they have multiple lo- locations throughout the state. They've got a central Ohio, central Ohio location, southeast Ohio, northwest Ohio, southwest Ohio, and a northeast Ohio. This is all on their website. We'll make sure there's a link to this in the show notes so that you guys can go figure out where your open house is and as well as there'll be links to the proposed rule changes. And they want you to come and give public comment on these proposed rule changes. So that's your opportunity to go and say, hey, on the multi-year valid regardless of residency, rule i think there should be some extra wording in there that says you need to be a a resident for two years before you can buy a multi-year or lifetime license or whatever it is you want to say that's your opportunity right that's the best way for them to get public comment and hear people's opinions and like jeff said there was just just last year right they had proposed a a rule change and There was a lot of public outcry, and it didn't go into effect. So it does work. They do listen, and this is your opportunity. Also, if you can't make the meetings, there also is an online form that can be filled out. Oh, that's good to know. So, yeah, yeah, we'll find that and put that in the show notes as well. But there is an online form that can be filled out stating your concerns or you know, whatever you'd like to express to them if you can't make the meetings. Okay. That's good to know. So are there any other changes you guys wanted to go over? Anything else that we haven't discussed yet? No, I think we covered all the big, bigger topics or the ones that are kind of open for conversation. The rest of the stuff, to me, was just kind of status quo. There was stuff in there on wording around 
electric vehicles or did you guys read read any of that at all i i read it um but i don't really recall much of it yeah i don't i don't know if it's it was more like like jake said it was more kind of definition of terms and sort of clarifying what they meant by all-purpose vehicle and stuff i I think Mm -hmm. i don't know that it's super like it if it really is that big of effect i don't know like i said i didn't get into it too deep they clarified some wording on the bringing carcasses back into ohio and i don't they don't state what the rule said before at this i'm looking at the summary of changes it says it is proposed that that the language in this rule be amended to state that no carcass or parts of a carcass of a deer from outside of Ohio may be brought into Ohio unless it meets certain specifications, i.e. deboned with no part of the spinal column and no soft tissue attached to any antlers or skull. I don't, I don't recall what the wording was before, but that's, I guess, mm-hmm. what they're proposing. The other nice thing about this is they, they give the actual, like, where in the Ohio Revised Code it lists this stuff. And so you can go read, you know, that's, that's 1501. And I don't, I I wish I knew how to read these properly, but I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, but 1501 section 31-19-02. If you want to look it up, there's, I think that's about it that I wanted to cover. I was just reading, you know, browsing through this document again. And there's, I think we covered everything. Yeah. Uh, The other one that, the other kind of proposed thing that people might be interested in is that there has been no change in bag limits for any county or the statewide bag limit. Oh, yeah. So if you're uh, in a place in the state that you feel the, the deer herd is too low and you think the bag limit should be reduced, you know, maybe that's something that you bring up. You know, I know a lot of people are having that concern. So um it's feedback that i'm sure uh the odnr would be interested in hearing and along those lines i saw in here that there are no proposed changes to the what they're now calling the management permits or the antlerless permits they're just saying that the antlerless aka management permits will be valid in cuyahoga delaware franklin hamilton lake lorraine lucas portage stark and summit counties until the day before deer gun season begins so basically same as last year all right well if there's nothing else like i said i think we covered everything we wanted to talk about these things just kind of have a sort of open table round table discussion on our thoughts on the proposed changes and and sort of give you guys the information so that if you do want to make a public comment at any of the events give you the information on how to do that, when those are, and get your voices heard. So with that, as always, I want to thank everybody for listening. Just We really, really appreciate it. If you're enjoying the show, share the episodes with your friends. We, we really want to get the information out to as many hunters as possible, as many people as possible. Even if they're not a hunter and you think they might be interested, send it to them. And check us out on Facebook. We're Ohio Huntsman. Check us out on Instagram. We're Ohio Huntsman underscore podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter. We send out new episode updates, any kind of news related things in deer hunting in Ohio or, or, or hunting in Ohio in general. And I think, I think that's it. So thank you everybody for listening and we'll talk to you next time. Mm-hmm.